Okay. Well, first and foremost, thank you guys for having me today. My name is Andrew Eggers. I work in the admissions office at Bay Area Medical Academy. Um, so we're a school based out of San Francisco, but we also have a campus in San Jose. And we're gonna go over that in this presentation, for example. And it is a slideshow presentation. I just wanna point out here in the beginning, if you guys have any questions, you're welcome to ask. We usually save those to the end though. <clears throat> we can get them in the chat. We can also talk out loud if ever you guys want to jump on and say any questions you have towards the end but i'm going to just hit every slide for example and then afterwards we'll go through stuff that you guys might want to know more about so um, this is our first slide and it really is a photo of our most long or our longest tenured instructor name's miss Irby, and so she teaches our medical assisting morning class for example in san francisco and she's actually the program director as well and so i want to read this mission statement because we really feel strongly about this so we strive for a community where everyone is given equal opportunities to succeed and move up the economic ladder. And we believe this is best achieved through vocational education. So just to break down this statement, if you will, the first part of it really talks about how we wanna give out equal opportunities to folks and students that is, for example, uh, no matter where they come from, their background, for example, um, to move up the economic ladder. <clears throat> and that means to make money in this world and be able to provide for your family. So not just money, but there's other benefits to that too, right? And then we believe this is best achieved through vocational education. Now, I totally understand because I went to a four-year school right out of high school. I actually lived in the dorms my first semester at Sacramento State. So let's say I did more traditional education, going through a four-year program, gaining a four-year bachelor's degree, and then I moved into the, to the workforce at that point. This education is slightly different. And I'm sure you guys have heard about traditional education and you may already have filled out applications or thought about universities or junior colleges you want to attend. And that's great. That's totally fine. I did it myself, right? But this education that we provide is geared towards say a different direction to ultimately help you find your career quickly and to give you skills right away. So when you go through a course like ours, there is no English class. There is no math class. There's not a science class per se. You learn a little bit of science, medical-based science, right? But it's not directly based on like biology or physics or chemistry, right? I remember those classes. They weren't very easy for me. Um, but the vocational training means we're training you for your career. And so we really just want to point that out. This photo is really good though, because Miss Serbia is obviously their center. And these are some classmates or students that, that she taught. This was actually taken a, a good amount of time ago, about five, six years ago. Um, so it's a great representation of the school and really kind of the hands-on element to the whole program and getting your, your fast track towards your career, but gaining skills along the way that are very vital towards, you know, getting into the medical field. So moving on. <clears throat> Oops. There we go. This is someone we wanted to point out because he's really a success story, we feel. His name's Edgar Soto. And so just so you guys know a little bit about Edgar, um, he's actually a graduate from the San Francisco campus, although he lived in the San Jose area, which is might sound strange, but he worked as an auto mechanic and he actually got off, I think it was like three or four in the afternoon. So he was able to drive up to San Francisco. And at the time, San Jose did not have an evening program. We do now, but he wanted to get his education with Bama, I guess you could say badly enough to make this work. And he was one of those guys I used to get off and I used to work on campus. I work from home now, but I used to get off around 5, 5.15, and he would always be there around like 4.30. And the evening class doesn't start till 5.30. So he was there like an hour early every night to gain time with the instructor if he was able to, or just study in the break room. Um, but the point is, he did really well in the program. He actually works at Stanford now during the week, and he was last working some COVID testing centers on the weekend, like doing seven days a week. I don't know if he's still doing that now. I haven't spoken with him recently. But it's a really cool success story. There's a lot of other success stories if you were to click on this link. And I'm going to send this presentation over after our presentation today. So you guys can always take a look and ever um, check it out. But this is on our website. So it's what we call Bama Heroes. Um, we're really trying to you know, tell you guys that working in the medical field is being a vital part of society um, and giving back to other people too. It's almost like a civil service in a way. Um, so in any case, he's a really great success story of what you could basically turn yourself into. There's other information in the website too that talks about his background and he did have a little trouble with the law at one point, I guess. But this is just one example of someone who could really like 
you know, forge their way um, in their career and in the medical field itself and do really good things long term. So there's a good amount of other success stories on there you guys may want to check out in the future. So you'll be welcome to. And this is more what we call our Bama Advantage. Now, we're not going to try to sell anybody on education. Let's just be clear on that. Like I work in the admissions office and my job is to essentially explain information all day to folks. And if they decide to enroll, then we move forward and do that. This is just kind of telling you guys like what separates us from other schools or other types of programs and whatnot. So it talks about proven outcomes and how we have 77% job placement within nine months after graduation for the San Jose students. And then that same <clears throat> calculation, it was 76% for nine months. This is based on our 2019 and 2020 classes. So it's a pretty uh, good number in our opinion to have that many students find a job that quickly after graduating. And we actually have a career services office that there's a separate slide for that I'll tell you about. But there's actual support on the back end trying to help students learn about jobs, apply for jobs, help them with the resume, kind of match them with employers if we're able to. So that's one thing we do want to point out. There are two people we're actually hiring a third now, but to work as a career services team, um, it's definitely a helpful thing. It's a lifetime service at that. So moving on, the real world skills. I kind of mentioned this when I highlighted vocational education. You learn and apply your knowledge of medical assisting to start your hands-on career. I mean, that's just really important to know that this could start your medical career. You may go on and do other things. And this is kind of like the tree stump that could grow in to a whole tree and branch off into other things, right? Um, in any case, that's my own analogy. Uh, accreditation. You guys may already know this. Your high school, by the way, is accredited. Um, it basically means they're held to a standard provided by that accreditor. So our accreditor is called Middle States Association of Schools and Colleges. So it's actually a regional accreditation. So we're pretty proud of that. In fact, that we hold a regional accreditation. Um, there's a big back and forth conversation about national versus regional accreditation. But in any case, uh, regional accreditation, national accreditation means you're held to that specific standard. In any case, we could go on on that, but you guys will probably fall asleep. Uh, the employer training pipelines, though, this is more important, right? This is helping students understand like exactly what type of employers and who we're working with, like the major players in the market that actually hire graduates from Bama. <clears throat> so you guys can read them all off. I'm sure you guys see them already. But there's some pretty big like heavy hitter names on there because we do have connections with like employers in the recruiting department um, at these different facilities. So we work really closely to fill job orders for employers and helping by basically match employers with students and vice versa. Um, so I'll tell you more about that when we get to the career services slide. This is the highlight though program at our school or the highlight of the medical assisting program at our school. It really is a great program because it's the only one I've ever heard of that's actually a three-in-one program. And we're going to focus on what a medical assistant does first and that sort of training. But there are two other courses that we'll talk about, and that's phlebotomy, and that's also EKG. Uh, phlebotomy, being able to draw the blood from somebody without supervision if you have a state license, as well as the EKG training, being able to operate the EKG machine, halter monitor testing, and stress testing, too. Um, so all of these things are provided as far as training, and we actually have a program that provides uh, three national certifications. So... I'll just kind of breeze through this. I don't want to read it line by line and get too stagnant here, but it's talking about working in the front line of the medical field and playing a crucial role. Um, it talks about vital signs, vaccinations, injections, and then drawing blood is phlebotomy. Uh, they also administer COVID-19 tests and assist in various procedures. So I like this example, although it may not be the best. So I have two sons. And so when we took my boys to the doctor, the pediatrician, right, you, you get checked in by a medical assistant, right? And the medical assistant is there to help throughout that process with that appointment. There's a doctor that comes in later on. They're going to actually see the patient, um, help come up with whatever, you know, diagnoses or solutions to that, right, within that appointment. The idea is the medical assistant is there to assist throughout that doctor's appointment. So when I took my boys to the pediatrician uh, long ago now, uh, we got them both circumcised. And just as a basic idea or example, the doctor is the one that performs the procedure, right? And the medical assistant's there to help clean and wipe and comfort and soothe the child, right? So you'll notice as far as medical assistants go, they work in lots of different facilities. I mean, they work in 
clinics and you're talking about like a general physician, you're talking about the podiatrist or the cardiologist or radiologist. I mean, any ologist, right, is going to need a medical assistant to help see their patients when they get checked into that appointment, as well as they work in COVID-19 testing centers at this point. There's a new position right now that's called medical screener that's popped up recently, as well as research assistant in clinical labs. So the medical assistants there to kind of check you in and help you throughout that visit. They can also work in urgent care sites, just so you guys know. Whenever you had like an injury, but it maybe wasn't serious enough to go to the ER and you got to the urgent care site, the medical assistant's probably the one that called your name and brought you into the office, got you all set up, and the doctor eventually came in afterwards to help check you out. So that's kind of just the general idea of what a medical assistant does and is, is uh, job responsibilities. This is more or less, and I talked about the tree stump earlier, but it's a great foundational career for getting basic patient care experience. And working in a clinic means you also work like an eight to five schedule, normally speaking. Um, so ultimately, this could lead to other positions. We've had lots of students go on and be LVNs or RNs or work as a PA, a physician assistant, right? So this could be what you start in, but it doesn't have to be what you end in. And it can be a great way if you wanna transition into say a nursing program at some point, you may work as a medical assistant for several years, go through nursing like as an evening student maybe, and then you can combine your education with your new nursing degree with the experience you got as a medical assistant. And now you have education and experience to basically sell yourself to an employer as a nurse someday. So it can be, of high benefit in multiple ways. Not only are you going to be able to work in a career pretty quickly, the point is you have options to move forward in your career afterwards also. So enough of this slide, let's move on. This next slide kind of highlights the structure of the course, if you will. And then I kind of hinted at this earlier when I talked about there's three national certification exams in this program. Technically speaking, it's included in tuition, so you don't pay extra. For example, we get you all packaged up either through financial aid or if someone wants to do payments, they're welcome to, but we also have scholarships we'll talk about in a moment. But there's one for medical assisting, there's one for a phlebotomy technician, and there's one for EKG technician. So there's a national exam for all three subjects in this program, and you can actually take them at different points in the course, which is pretty nice because you can spread them out and be certified for, say, phlebotomy or EKG right after you finish those two classes. And then medical assisting is kind of covered in the whole course. So you usually take that one as like a cumulative exam towards the end of the course itself. Now, beyond the three national certification exams, we also help the student get a state license. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the state license is only for phlebotomy. California is actually one of four states in the U.S. where it's a specific state license that you must have in order to work as a phlebotomist. If you look at it further, it basically gives someone, a phlebotomist that is, the permission to draw blood without doctor supervision. Because normally speaking, medical assistants are allowed to draw your blood as long as they're supervised by a doctor at that time. If a medical assistant also holds a phlebotomy license, they would now be allowed to draw blood without doctor supervision. So this can open up better jobs, we feel like, because it gives you more possible responsibility in the future. So you can do more at the site you may work at. So that's really important to talk about. It's a three-in-one program. So you get three national certification exams, which those I should talk a little bit about too. A national exam helps you compete on a nationwide level for jobs, meaning that those certifications are recognized in all 50 states. It'll certainly help you apply for jobs here locally because it'll help you compete against other people who probably have those national exams done as well. And if not, you already have a leg up on those folks here locally. But moving out of state, it's an easy way for an employer to recognize how qualified you are when you hold a national certification exam because that standard is recognized in all 50 states. You can move around if you ever wanted to and the employer can instantly know what kind of skills you hold by having those national certification exams under your belt. And then the program length and scheduling. So it's a nine or 11 month program consisting of seven class modules and a 200 or 240 hour clinical externship. How this works is there's actually three days, sorry, there's three schedules in San Francisco and there's two in San Jose, which we'll cover in just a moment. But all of our day classes take nine months. And those are three total schedules that we offer for daytime classes between both campuses. 
there are two evening programs, one at each campus and they're at the same time, but that evening program takes a little bit longer. So I should probably say that a little better. So let's talk about it real quick. Uh, the San Jose day class schedule, you'll see it's 9.30 to three, that's Monday through Friday. And then the San Francisco day classes, there's two of them. So one's at nine to 2.30 and then the other one's 10 to 3.30. These two, these three, sorry, classes are all nine months in length. So that makes it, so these two bullet points at the top, those are nine month programs. It's the evening program, that third bullet point. It's offered 5.30 to 10, Monday through Friday at both campuses. It takes a little longer. It's almost 11 months. It's like 10 months and three weeks, technically. But the idea is it's a little bit more spread out because it's only rated at four hours a night versus the daytime classes are rated at five hours a day. And just as a heads up now, we had to get kind of creative, if you will, when we were going through this pandemic, which obviously we're still kind of going through the tail end of it, if anything. So we do four days a week online right now for Zoom calls, which are Zoom lectures, sorry. Kind of like this one, but it takes at least two or three hours for that lecture. They dismiss you and then they give you homework or assignments or you watch videos for simulated labs, maybe a group project or case study or something along those lines. Um, but they keep you active for that time frame, for example. And then one day a week, they go in for a lab day at this point, and it's anywhere from say three to four hours in person. This has worked fairly well for us uh, for this time period, but we'll probably add more lab days to the class in the future. I haven't been told anything about going back to fully in person at this time, which it could or couldn't happen, or it may or may not happen here soon. Um, I would expect us to probably offer a hybrid program going forward though, because it seems to work well for students who either work or have other commitments outside of school and work. The fourth bullet point, uh, was what I just covered. So as far as the four online lectures and one in-person lab, and then there is an externship at the end. So that's the fifth bullet point there. It is at least five weeks total. I know it says 200 or 240 hours. That extra 40 hours could be the case if the site requires you for the sixth week. It's not typical, for example, but it is something they have the right to do if they would like. Um, so in any case, the externship is normally five weeks long. So that means it's going to be a five week commitment at the very end of the course. Technically speaking, it's always a daytime commitment too. So that means it's eight to five, Monday through Friday. So it's a full 200 hours, meaning four, 40 hours a week for five weeks in a row. It's nice though, because you get four weeks as an MA and one week as a phlebotomist. Sorry if I have some emails popping in here. Uh, I should have probably muted that uh, website, but in any case, you have four weeks as an MA working in a clinic, for example, as an extern, and then you have one week as a phlebotomy extern, and that would be in a lab. And BAM has it all set up for externships. And some of those employers, if not all of them on the first page there, uh, SF General, UCSF, Kaiser, Sutter, CPMC, One Medical Group, the Chinese Hospital, Chinatown Public Health, Mission Neighborhood Health Center, uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation is a popular one now, especially for those on the East Bay. But there's a good amount of sites. Um, so if anything, we try to work with students to figure out what's best for them closest to home or maybe where they want to work someday and try to get them into interview with that particular extern uh, site itself. So I don't want to take too long on this. I'll keep going to the next slide. Hopefully you guys have some good questions for me at the end. Um, career opportunities. So this is just kind of talking about some of the new career opportunities, I should say. And this is during the time period of COVID. So we had students working at Emoja Health Wellness and Justice Center. And then we also had them working at the UCS COVID testing site and vaccination clinics. This was, at, and also at Sutter too, by the way, you'll see that other bullet points kind of small there, but this was actually really interesting. And these, not, these were not necessarily graduates at the time. We actually were allowed to have students and they counted these hours towards their classes, their lab time, for example. But there was even students who hadn't graduated yet allowed to work and get paid, by the way. Um, after they meet a certain amount of hours, they just had to start taking um, a paycheck, basically. But during the pandemic, we had lots of students working at these facilities. And even beyond that, when they graduate, they can eventually work as a full-time employee at these sites as well. So moving on. We'll talk about the next slide here, which is a little bit more about the financial aid conversation. We're actually going to go back to the program here in a moment, too. But just to kind of cover some of these details real quick, financial aid is something where it's through the government. It's called FAFSA. You guys may have already had workshops to fill this out so far through high school. If not, it will probably come soon. But the idea is for these 
FAFSA recipients is they can apply and be granted um, student loans and grant money. Uh, grant money is money that they don't pay back because it's something that they have qualified for, as well as student loans. They qualify for these, but they do have to pay back the student loans. So those are options through the government to help make school affordable. Um, so in any case, we also have some scholarships, which I'm going to highlight here in a moment, but these scholarships are actually through Bay Area Medical Academy at this point. Um, just as a heads up, we're actually in our final stages of becoming a nonprofit. So we've already been approved by the IRS, but we will be approved here soon to be a full nonprofit. And we've already received grants and some donations, for example, to actually have money for, for these scholarships. So that's kind of where the school is headed. And then work study is actually through financial aid as well. There are certain students who can qualify to work on campus and actually get paid through financial aid and partially through the school uh, in order to work on campus. There are limited hours though, of course, because they're in classes. So they're supposed to be uh, only doing 20 hours a week, I believe it is. And ultimately, I already talked a little about the loans, but I'll just make sure to mention that there are student loans, for example, and there are also parent loans, which are parent loans, meaning that you're maybe under the age of 24. And if you're still considered a dependent student by the FAFSA, our federal student application for financial aid, uh, they will deem you a dependent and your parents may need to be involved in the financial aid conversation. But the nice thing about Bama is we actually have two different people, our financial aid staff, for example, that can meet with you guys over the phone at this point, we may open up for in-person appointments in the future. But in the meantime, we've met with students over the phone to help guide them with the FAFSA if they need it, or at least answer questions on what they can qualify for. And if they decide to move forward, of course, we can always help apply their financial aid towards our tuition and help them sign up for whatever benefits they're supposed to receive. So we have Tanya and Marquita, actually. There's two financial aid advisors at BAM at this point. So we'll go on. Um, this is the scholarship page. So this is what you guys might be most interested in, in any case, because it's a great way to help reduce any of the loan debt you may have, or if you set up a payment plan instead of doing loans, right, it could reduce that cost. By the way, I should have mentioned, we do offer payment plans for folks who would like to make cash payments instead of using the financial aid, but scholarships are essentially something that we have set up. There is a high school scholarship, which I believe all of you students would apply for or qualify for in that case because of the fact that you're either graduating this year or if you graduate in a couple years, we have this high school scholarship every single year. And this is for students who are graduating in that calendar year, for example. And what we ask is that they apply. And there's a link I can send you guys. It's through our website, but they actually write an essay. And then the essay gets evaluated by our scholarship committee. Um, and we also have potential for a scholarship interview with one of our, say, program directors and or Ms. Irby, uh, or instructors and or Ms. Irby, the program director. So that's for high school students who are graduating this year. And so for 2022, or if you guys graduate in 2023 or 2024, whichever year it happens to be, we offer this high school scholarship every single year. Um, now, the next scholarship on there, it says African-American student scholarship. And then we have one for Latino students, the Latinx scholarship. And we also have one that we just got set up recently, which has been sponsored by Seafood City. Uh, it's the Filipino Student Scholarship. So for these scholarships, it's the same requirement of writing an essay. And just as heads up, there's only three essay questions and they're having you write like why you think you'd be a great fit in the medical field, for example. Um, stuff like that, where you're responding, you write an essay. We also wanna see your most recent unofficial transcripts, for example, just to see where you're at with your previous schooling. Uh, but it could be anywhere from say a couple hundred to actually a couple thousand I've seen, and sometimes you know a little bit more, uh, but this is awarded through the school. So the idea is that it's something where we're trying to help reduce any kind of loan debt, any kind of payment plan debt, for example, that you may come up with with our tuition, for example, which we can talk about. Our tuition is actually 15654 and that's a grand total. I don't have a slide that says that necessarily, um, but the idea is that that includes everything, all the exams, the scrubs, the textbooks, the in-class materials, the licensing fee, for example. There's a CPR class that you have to take on a Sunday afternoon. It's included as well. I'm getting kind of on a tangent here, guys, but um, just so you know, 15,654, that is the grand total. If you look at other courses like ours, I believe we're still the cheapest in the Bay Area. So don't quote me on that either, but I'm pretty confident in that. 
Um, let's talk about phlebotomy though. This is something that's really popular. If you can imagine people call in all the time and ask about phlebotomy because we do offer a separate phlebotomy class and we also offer a separate EKG class. But if you guys happen to do it within the medical assisting program, it's actually module seven. In module seven, they do half phlebotomy and then half medical assisting still. So the idea is like, I don't want to read from this to make it boring. The phlebotomist is the person that you see normally in a lab. And they're drawing blood either out of the inside of your arm or the top of your hand. So the idea is you have to have a specific state license for California to actually work as a phlebotomist. They also know how to do skin sticks. And that requires a very small amount of blood. You probably guys have heard of or seen that, like the finger pricks, for example. Um, so for example, that's what a phlebotomist does. They usually work in a lab. They can also work in COVID testing centers. They can work in specialized clinics. They can work in blood banks too. And then you may have heard of this, or you probably will in the future, at least mobile phlebotomy. It's kind of a new thing. It came out before the pandemic started, but it's given, uh, people the ability to go out into the field and draw someone's blood, whether it's at their personal residence, or if it's maybe they're at a, you know, caregiving center, for example, um, the idea is that with technology, blood is now able to be stored for longer periods of time. So they can draw your blood and get it back to the, you know, the site that they're working at, for example, and still be okay. So for our students, I'm going to read the right hand side here a little bit. They actually complete a 60 hour portion within the class that's module seven. And then after they take the national certification exam, which is just one of the three, they're allowed to do the 40 hour clinical externship, which is technically the fifth week of that five week externship. So if you can imagine the first four weeks are medical assisting, the last week is the phlebotomy externship itself. And just so you guys know, some of the sites I rattle off earlier, or most of them, I should say, you can actually do all five weeks at the same site. So some sites like UCSF is actually the opposite. They don't take our phlebotomy students for whatever reason. They will let you do MA there, but we put you into a different lab, say for the phlebotomy, if that's what you had chosen to go to UCSF for the MA. Most sites though, like SF General is probably our biggest partner. They would love to have you for all five weeks. They actually feel more comfortable if you spend the first four weeks in the clinics and then the last week in the lab. So in any case, at the end of the program, we're going to help students apply for the California State CPT one. Just to point this out, there are three national exams, right? But the state of California only wants you to apply for the CPT one license at the end. They don't want you to take a state test. Sometimes people get confused and they'll be calling me like, well, when do I take that state test you mentioned? I said, well, I didn't mention that. So it's a little confusing. The national certification exams are separate from the California state license. The state license you actually apply for. So you actually wait, I believe, six to eight weeks at this time to get that back from the state of California. So I don't know how many of you, how many of you have gone to the DMV in your lives, but it's kind of like going to the DMV, working with the state of California. In any case, moving on to the EKG program itself. This is module five, by the way. So actually they do three weeks of EKG and then the other week or weeks, depending on if you do evening classes, is still medical assisting. This is actually a really good picture to kind of describe what an EKG technician is able to do. They're able to put up these electrodes, these monitoring devices, for example, on the chest, arms, and even leg area of the student, uh, the patient, excuse me. And these, inter, uh, these produce heart rhythms, heart rhythm strips, in fact. And the EKG technician is able to interpret those heart rhythm strips and able to report to the doctor or the nurse in charge of the patient, like what's actually happening with this patient's cardiovascular system. So that's a really good picture to show kind of how it looks like in the field. Um, they're going to take the national certification exam for this particular field and career as well. And that's actually through National Health Careers Association, for example. So in any case, that's just one of the three exams as well. And they can ultimately use the electrocardiogram machine and be able to operate that. For example, in our program, they also learn how to do halter monitor testing or stress testing. Halter monitoring is like a actual device that you get strapped to your arm most of the time. And patients usually like wear it around for a certain period of time. And that also helps uh, the doctors understand kind of what's going on with the patient in that case as well. So it's a separate test, but you learn how to do that in this course also. We just don't have a photo of that specifically. And then moving into the career services top topic, 
Career services is there to assist and guide and help support. We just can't say it's a for sure thing because obviously the student has to go out and interview with that employer and the student would have to actually make an impression right and earn the job through the interview process so they just won't be handed a job after they graduate. But the idea is that we want to make sure that we give them the tools, the strategies it talks about to conduct a successful job search. And so resume writing is really kind of the start. There's actually a workshop in this course for resume writing. And then there's also going to be mock interviews. Mock interviews, you actually work with either Shane or Renee uh, doing basically like career consultations with them. And then they can schedule or do them right then the mock interview, for example. And it's really understanding like what you should say when you're asked certain questions or how you should approach certain topics. Um, kind of giving you some canned responses, if you will. Canned response means like if I get asked, like, why do I think I'm a good fit for this job? I kind of already know what I'm going to say uh, when I get asked that question. And then job search assistance, not only will you get emailed job leads on a weekly basis, but they actually have employers who will send in job orders and ultimately want to hire from the graduate pool. And in these cases, we'll try to match students and send their resumes back to the employers for the student to hopefully get interviewed in the future. Sorry, my son's in the background in the other room. And it's Monster Jam, I guess, going on out there with his little truck. So sorry about the background noise. Um, there's also employer and alumni visits. So these are Bama graduates as far as alumni go. And then the employers actually like to visit. It's all done on Zoom now because, of course, we do the four days online. The idea is that these employers are sometimes recruiters. And wanting to talk to students before you graduate is a great way for them to kind of cherry pick who they want to interview once the student finishes the course. But these employers will try to tell you how great it is to work there. You know, they'll kind of give you a heads up on the day in the life of an MA at their facility and what they're able to do or what they don't do. For example, at Kaiser, they don't do as much, say, scope of practice as you would like at a smaller doctor's office, just because you're usually given more responsibility to do more things. As, as far as Kaiser goes, they kind of want you to specialize in certain things and focus on those. Not all, but that's kind of the idea. And then also two employers are there to really try to uh, gauge, you know, what kind of program we offer in that case. And when they get good graduates, then they potentially hire more. And if they were to show up on your Zoom calls, it's probably because they're already a big partner of ours. The career consultation and workshops, these are more specific for either working with the career services individually or having workshops where we host different things like resume guidance or interview skill prep, um, stuff like that will be offered to students along the way. This is where our medical assistant graduates work. And you'll notice there's a lot of great names on here. Um, as a big sports fan and a huge Warriors fan, I was most excited actually, it was at the beginning of the pandemic when we had several of our students gain employment with the Warriors. And this was for COVID testing, they actually traveled with the team too. When it came down to it, they were there basically at all times, um, working for the Warriors and testing for COVID during that time. Now there's other ones on there like Palo Alto Medical Foundation, Sutter, um, Marin Community Clinic, Regional Medical Center. These really range from different types. I mean, it could be a specialized doctor that these medical assistants work for, or it could be um, a general clinic, for example. There's medical assistants working all over the place when it comes to checking in patients and recording vital signs and helping that doctor throughout that visit, whether it's a more specialized practice or procedure they do, or if it's more a general physician, uh, learning a lot of different things. So yeah, these are just kind of a handful or if you will, a list of graduates, uh, sorry, places where our graduates are working. And I'm not trying to go too quick now, but I do want to stop and make sure that everyone's questions get answered as well. And sometimes we get a lot of good questions. So this is actually the last slide. Um, my contact information is there along with the financial aid advisor, Tanya Parker. She's actually our, our lead financial aid advisor, so to speak. We want you to know if you ever want to take a photo of this, for example, you want to call, you want to email. This is actually my line, the text line. I have students who text and just ask questions sometimes as well. We would normally offer you a 30 to 40 minute phone call where we can sit down with you and your family if you would like. And the first couple of minutes is just asking a couple of questions to get to know the person. And then the last 35, 40 minutes is basically explaining the course. And actually I have a program sheet that I send you and we go over it together on the phone call. And if the student wants to move forward after that point, we actually schedule the financial aid call for Tanya or even Marquita to make. 
And that student would basically just kind of work with the financial aid staff until everything works out on their end to where they can financially make it all work. And if they move forward in that case, then we'll get back in touch and go through the admissions enrollment paperwork, for example, with the advisor like myself. And that's how it is. Probably takes at least a couple of weeks to get you enrolled. They never try to enroll you on the first day. That's not the point. We want to make sure everybody is like good and comfortable with their financial aid packaging, for example. So we usually don't even schedule the financial aid for the first day. It's usually like, hey, if I meet with you today, schedule financial aid maybe for tomorrow, maybe take two or three appointments in financial aid. And then once you finish up, it's usually when I get the phone call like, hey, you know, John wants to finish up his MA enrollment paperwork and you pick this start date. And it's kind of like, okay, great. Let's get that going for him. So that's just kind of a quick overview on how our process works too when it comes to like introducing this program to, to folks or your parents. We have had lots of parents on the, you know, speaker or even three-way calls. And we've done presentations to students that way as well. I do want to introduce before I open it up for questions too. So Angelo and I is on the phone as well or on the Zoom call. He's actually partly our high school outreach coordinator and he also works in admissions with myself and our staff. We actually have Angelo, Leanna and Catherine and myself. And then we actually have a scheduler as well. His name is Darren and he works on the marketing side of things. But Angelo is here on the call today too. So I did, I did want to introduce him. Um, as he was the one who set this up originally. All right, so sorry, I did a lot of talking there. I should probably take a drink of water. Do you guys want to fire off some questions? Um, I was wondering if you ever have students who go through your program and then, you know, so that, that way they can get to work sooner, but then maybe they go on afterwards mm -hmm. to you know, like a typical college to continue on towards a higher position. Yeah, absolutely. It happens both ways. Sometimes I'll get a call from someone straight out of high school and they're like, this is what I want to do. I've always known I want to do this because my long-term plan is nursing and I plan on doing MA right away, get working. And then I'll do like usually night school or online classes, right? For their AA, get the AA, then decide I want to move into a nursing four-year degree most likely is the idea. Some schools go through or have offered an associate's degree in nursing, which is great too. So they can obviously go into nursing programs that way. But yeah, we get told lots of times whether there are students who already did a two-year because now I'm kind of flipping the other side of it. So we have students who will go through an associate's degree straight out of high school and maybe they worked you know, wherever during those two or three years, retail, fast food, customer service, wherever, right? And now they finish the two-year degree and they realize, hmm, I want to be a nurse someday. I did my two years, I did all my prereqs, but they understand because probably some college counselor told them like, hey, if you want to be a nurse someday, it's usually good if you start out in a lower level medical position because long-term, the job that you apply for as a nurse, they kind of want to see that you've done patient care before. So I do get told by even students who have an AA already or who have years of working in a different career, like, hey, I understand my long-term goal is this, but they told me I need to do basic patient care. And that's why I'm coming to you guys, because that is kind of how, it, you know, if it, it's like a staircase. Every career is kind of like a staircase. You never jump in at the top. You always kind of work your way up from the bottom. And it happens, though, that medical is the same way. And there's different levels of education as well. So, yeah, we get students who are either looking to do nursing physician assistant, nurse practitioner. I've had lots of people tell me they wanted to be a doctor someday and it's going to take some time, right? But they want to be a medical assistant so they can have a career now, make a decent wage. And then they go back and do usually night school or weekend or evening classes, or I mean, online classes in order to finish, finish up their associates, then their bachelors. And if they go on to do, you know, doctor program, that's obviously beyond that. It's a good question. And it's very much like, Almost everyone I speak to is like, yeah, I want to be a nurse in there. I want to be this. Almost everyone. I mean, it's probably like 80 to 90 percent. Jamie, do you have any questions? You can put them in the chat or unmute. And then um, a couple of the students here had to go, but we have another student here, but she doesn't have questions right now. It's no worries, you know, and that's why we're here. Um, like Angela may have mentioned, I mean, we work Monday through Friday from around eight to five as well. Um, so any questions, if you guys want to email them over, you can always text this line. It's a 415-212-8470 with a Google voice line. 
I take messages, you know, call people back, obviously, if they call me, but sending a text is just fine too. I always like if you could just say like, hey, this is, you know, Jonathan from Castro Valley High School or something, just so I kind of know what we're like the context of everything. But yeah, we're happy to answer questions. We have a staff of people really at this point guiding students into the course with information essentially. So yeah, we're totally fine to help answer questions later on. Well, perfect. Um, and I'll definitely share the recording with students as well. Yeah, right on. We couldn't be here. Yeah. No, that's so fine. It looks like maybe one question did come in. Okay, Jamie said she thinks she's okay. That's fine. So no problem. We're we're just happy to be able to share the word, if you will. Bama started in 2005, and that's just kind of uh, what we did in the first place was phlebotomy only. It was actually called Phlebotomy Unlimited. And so Simonita, who's our campus director and founder, she actually just rented a space at that point and hired an instructor and got the class off the ground. It was a 2010 or 2011, actually. I think so we started the 2000 and the MA started in 2010, and then we got financial aid approved in 2011. So now the students could use financial aid because you have to prove, you know, a certain level of competence for the course first. Otherwise, yeah, we've been rolling ever since with our medical assisting program. We also offer the phlebotomy and EKG separately. So it's really good entry level careers that students can start out in. But we understand that this usually isn't their, their end, you know, it's just the start. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah right on and it's it, you know yeah like these these sort of careers and whatnot are very you know very obtainable for anybody who has the right certification and training basically right well i'll go ahead and stop sharing if you guys want to have a great rest of your day i want to say goodbye and thanks for having us all right thank you most welcome you take care now